you've had in more than 80 visits uh, where you are either Zooming or in person with a congressional staffer trying to get their members' attention about AI X risk. Tell me about, and our audience, about um, those meetings, how you put them together, how they're going. I mean, one thing I was surprised by is just how much interest and enthusiasm there is here. Um, with a lot of other topics, it's much harder to get staffer attention, much harder to get attention from relevant agency experts. But we really are in an optimistic uh, or sort of in a, in a pleasant scenario where um, Congress and uh, executive branch agencies are really, really interested to learn more about AI, to learn more about AI risks. Uh, in particular, the AI and national security space, I think, is extremely interested in getting more consultations with outside groups and outside experts. I think policymakers uh, more intuitively understand why uh, AI that can develop bioweapons is dangerous. But if you tell them AI is going to automate research and development and then it's going to get really, really powerful, that's not necessarily intuitively all that scary compared to, say, the bioweapon case. Um, and I think some of the, the most valuable work I suspect uh, we might be able to do on the messaging and communication side will be trying to make sure that those harder to understand, less intuitive threat models that are still very important um, are actually getting the, the time of day. Some of the congressional offices, let's say, and some of the executive branch folks, they're tasked with AI stuff, like their boss, their, their senator, um, or their uh, you know, representative is um, saying, I'm going to take the lead on AI, or I'm going to want to introduce AI legislation. And then if you're talking to a staffer from one of those offices, it's very different than if you're talking to a staffer who's just generally curious and generally interested. I think for the offices that are working on a particular angle of it, usually coming in and asking them, like, where are you at? What feedback would be most helpful to you? Here are some thoughts I have on the draft legislation you already released is often a great way to get the conversation going. With, a, with sort of a, a randomly selected office, I'll usually start by saying, hey, I'm Akash. Here's what I'm focusing on. I'm really focused on AI and national security threats with a focus right now on emergency preparedness, which is all about how can the federal government mm. improve its ability to detect mm. and respond to time sensitive AI national security threats. Um, I love with that, that in mind. I can talk to you about all sorts of other things in the AI and AI safety space as well. Um, would you like to hear more about emergency preparedness or are there other topics on your mind that you also want to prioritize in this meeting? That's kind of how I'll do that. That's this. so good, Akash. That's so good. I've never heard the term emergency preparedness applied to AI risk before in my entire life. And it's great because it's like baked in the language of things government cares about right yeah. now. You and know, like there's like, so much we can draw from. I, I, I've been very excited about um, what I'm calling emergency preparedness. Um because in the counterterrorism world, in the pandemic preparedness world, in the nuclear security world, this concept of preparedness already, there, there's already an understanding of it. There's not yes. as much of an inferential gap as with other things. And a nice Yes, and they know they have to put budget to it too, right? It's yeah, like emergency yeah. preparedness is a big ticket item. This is not like some soft thing that like we're like thinking about, like we're exactly. doing Exactly. And another nice property is it gets us away from some of the debates on like, like exactly how likely is a particular threat from occurring. I think the preparedness um, world is much more comfortable saying, hey, we are dealing with very uncertain events. We don't know exactly what, you know, so-and-so terrorist group is going to do or exactly how so-and-so yeah. state actor might get nuclear weapon. <clears throat> but what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, we're going to try to map out any threats that seem credible, that seem plausible, and make sure we're prepared for them. And that's a very different type of conversation than conversations that are like, uh, you know, this is going to happen with 99 percent or like 90 percent certainty. Right. With AI, I right. think it's understanding that people are not very good at predicting things. I mean, certainly government people are very, uh, you know, much like, hey, we don't know what's going on here. We don't understand how the technology works. And so the preparedness frame says you don't need to have certainty. You don't need to understand exactly what risks are worth paying the most attention to. But if they meet some sort of threshold of plausibility, if there are at least some credible experts who are worried about these really big impact events, uh, big impact national security threats, we should probably have a playbook in place um, to make sure we are doing the right things to detect those threats. And if we detect something, we're not just like figuring out on the fly, oh, what do we do now? We've had some people thinking about if we see X, we should do Y. 
Yeah, that's so good. Because if you think about it in the terms of like a terrorist attack or something, or even like an asteroid or anything, it'd be like, um, you know, we have this department associated with this. We have this budget allocated to this. We have no idea when it's going to happen. And that's a ridiculous question to ask. You know, when is the asteroid going to come? We don't know, but we just know that we're using the best tech and the best people to prepare for it should it come, right? That's such a better framework than like, you need to tell me exactly how it's going to happen and when before I'll move a finger. Yeah, exactly. And typically, a congressperson will really just be focused on the issues of their committees and maybe one or two other pet issues that might go outside of the, the, the committees. So even though like the whole of Congress, for the most part, is quite interested in AI education, it's actually not that hard to narrow down to like who are the 20 or 30 key people who will be thinking the most about AI in the context of national security. The folks on the armed services committees and the folks on the homeland security committees, for example, being some of the, the most relevant there. Um, with, with, of course, since, you know, AI is touching so many things, the USAI Safety Institute is based at Commerce, so the Commerce Committees matter, Energy is doing some stuff. So I'm not saying it's like only those people, but I think it, it yeah. helped me get a better sense of how to strategize here. Like, is it really like you're just supposed to go to like all 400 plus offices or is there more of a prioritization? Uh, and when you go to certain offices, how do you know what their perspective is going to be? Well, if they're on the Commerce Committee, they're probably going to be on uh, on average interested in different things than if they're on the armed services committee or the homeland security committee. Sure. Sure. What is your sense of, from the meetings you've had, uh, to just back to our conversation just a moment ago about X risk versus job loss versus terrorism. Are there, um, you know, I don't know if you had a hundred points and you had three buckets, wh where do you put the points in terms of where their heads at the average congressional office? Oh, where their head is at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say probably like uh, 80 points on competitive, uh, competitiveness in China. Um, wow. That is definitely the most commonly, um, th that's the most um, wow. biggest concern in the heads of, I think, policymakers. Because for a lot of other national security threats that involve emerging technology, you're not worried about like misalignment or like the technology autonomously doing things. You're just worried about bad actors for the most part. And I right. think there's a big bipartisan um, sentiment right now that's very critical of and skeptical of China and really wants to make sure the U.S. stays ahead of China in terms of AI um, uh, cutting edge technologies. So I yeah. think how, place there. Mm -hmm. I was say, how do you handle that? You know, what, what is your approach to the, oh, well, we can't stop because China will just get it and then dominate us. And And the first thing I go to in my head is that like, <clears throat> um, from everything I read, AGI is not going to care about the nationality of its creator or have any loyalty to anything that is pink, squishy, and filled with meat. Um, but what, you know, how do you go at the China problem? Yeah, no, that, I mean, that that's one of the million dollar <laughs> questions right now for um, U.S. policy, especially um, national security focused policy. Um, I think that one of the most important things to be doing right now is raising awareness about some of the intelligence explosion, AI research and development, misalignment, loss of control types of threat models. Um, because I think it, 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 I don't think it's really about convincing people that they should feel one way or another about China. Like I'm not a China expert. I think a lot of policymakers have thought way more about China and how well they are at, you know, uh, cooperating in international agreements than I have. That's not going to be my value add. My value add is going to be saying, hey, this is a unique kind of issue where not only do you have to factor in all of your beliefs about US-China competitiveness, but also there's this misalignment thing you have to worry about. There's this loss of control thing you have to worry about. If we go too quickly without the proper safeguards, um, if the competitive pressures continue and we develop really powerful AI systems without the proper governance techniques, it's not going to matter if we get there first. It's going to be bad for everyone.